Hi there and welcome. I'm Mary. I am a librarian at the Claremont Branch Library and I'm glad to have you joining for the daily reading of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz. Today we'll be reading chapters 15 and 16 and if you remember yesterday our friends made it to the rock and escaped the gargoyles but when they went inside the rock trying to get to the top of the earth they ended up in the lair of the dragonettes where they were able to escape but they ended up in a dead-end room where they were stuck in there unable to get out but Dorothy told her friends that Ozma and Oz every day would check on her with her magic picture and if Dorothy gave a specific signal Ozma would use the magic belt and wish her to Oz so that's what Dorothy does she gives the signal to Ozma and Ozma wishes her with the magic belt to the land of Oz and Dorothy asks Ozma to bring her friends to Oz also and that's where we pick up in chapter 15 with Dorothy and all her friends in the land of Oz so let's see what happens now that we have made it to the land of Oz chapter 15 old friends are reunited many servants dressed in handsome uniforms stood ready to welcome the new arrivals and when the wizard got out of the buggy a pretty girl in a green gown cried out in surprise why it's the wonderful wizard come back again the little man looked at her closely and then took both the maiden's hands in his and shook them cordially on my word he exclaimed it's little Jellia Jam, as pert and pretty as ever. Why not, Mr. Wizard? asked Jellia, bowing low. But I'm afraid you cannot rule the Emerald City as you used to, because we now have a beautiful princess whom everyone dearly loves. And the people will not willingly part with her, added a tall soldier in a captain general's uniform. The wizard turned to look at him. Did you not wear green whiskers at one time? he asked. Yes, said the soldier, but I shaved them off long ago, and since then I have risen from a private to be the chief general of the royal armies. That's nice, said the little man, but I assure you, my good people, that I do not wish to rule the land of the Emerald City, he added earnestly. In that case, you are welcome, cried all the servants, and it pleased the wizard to note the respect with which the royal retainers bowed before him his fame had not been forgotten in the land of oz by any means where is dorothy inquired zeb anxiously as he left the buggy and stood beside his friend the little wizard she is with the princess ozma in the private rooms of the palace replied jellia jam but she has ordered me to make you welcome and to show you to your apartments the boy looked around him with wondering eyes such magnificence and wealth as was displayed in this palace was more than he had ever dreamed of and he could scarcely believe that all the gorgeous glitter was real and not tinsel what is to become of me asked the horse uneasily he had seen considerable of life in the cities in his younger days and knew that this regal palace was no place for him it perplexed even jellia jam for a time to know what to do with the animal the green maiden was much astonished at the sight of so unusual a creature, for horses were unknown in this land. But those who lived in the Emerald City were apt to be astonished by queer sights, so after inspecting the cab horse and noting the mild look in his big eyes, the girl decided not to be afraid of him. There are no stables here, said the wizard, unless some have been built since I went away. We have never needed them before, answered Jellia for the sawhorse lives in a room of the palace, being much smaller and more natural in appearance than this great beast you have brought with you. Do you mean I am a freak? asked Jim angrily. Oh no, she hastened to say. There may be many more like you in the place you came from, but in Oz, any horse but a sawhorse is unusual. This mollified Jim a little, and after some thought, the green maiden decided to give the cab horse a room in the palace such a big building having many rooms that were seldom in use so zeb unharnessed jim and several of the servants then led the horse around to the rear where they selected a nice large apartment that he could have all to himself then jellia said to the wizard 
Your own room, which was the back of the great throne room, has been ba vacant ever since you left us. Would you like it again? Yes, indeed, returned the little man. It will seem like being home again, for I lived in that room for many, many years. He knew the way to it, and a servant followed him, carrying his satchel. Zeb was also escorted to a room, so grand and beautiful that he almost feared to sit in the chairs or lie upon the bed, lest he might dim their splendor. In the closets he discovered many fancy costumes of rich velvets and brocades, one, and one of the attendants told him to dress himself in any of the clothing that, he ple that pleased him, and to be prepared to dine with Princess and Dorothy in an hour's time. Opening from the chamber was a fine bathroom, having a marble tub with perfumed water. So the boy, still dazed by the novelty of his surroundings, indulged in a good bath and then selected a maroon velvet costume with silver buttons to replace his own soiled and much worn clothing. There were silk stockings and soft leather slippers with diamond buckles to accompany his new costume. And when he was fully dressed, Zeb looked much more dignified and imposing than ever before in his life. He was all ready when an attendant came to escort him to the presence of the princess. He followed bashfully and was ushered into a room more dainty and attractive than it was splendid. Here he found Dorothy seated beside a young girl so marvelously beautiful that the boy stopped suddenly with a gasp of admiration. But Dorothy sprang up and ran to seize her friend's hand, drawing him impulsively toward the lovely princess who smiled most graciously upon her guest. Then the wizard entered, and his presence relieved the boy's embarrassment. The little man was clothed in black velvet, with many sparkling emerald ornaments decorating his breast. But his bald head and wrinkled features made him appear more amusing than impressive. Ozma had been quite curious to meet the famous man who had built the Emerald City, and united the Munchkins, Gillikins, Quadlings, and Winkies into one people. So when they were all four seated at the dinner table, the princess said, Please tell me, Mr. Wizard, whether you called yourself Oz after this great country, or whether you believe my country is called Oz after you, it is a matter that I have long wished to inquire about, because you are of a strange race, and my own name is Ozma. No one, I am sure, is better able to explain this mystery than you. That is true, answered the little wizard. Therefore, it will give me great pleasure to explain my connection with your country. In the first place, I must tell you that I was born in Omaha, and my father, who was a politician, named me Oscar, Zorister, Friedrich, Isaac, Norman, Henkel, Emmanuel, Ambrose Diggs. Diggs being the last name, because it, he could think of no more to go after it. Taken together, it was a dreadfully long name to weigh down a poor innocent child, and one of the hardest lessons I ever learned was to remember my own name. When I grew up, I just called myself Oz, because the other initials were P-I-N-H-E-A-D, -D, and that spelled Pinhead, which was a reflection on my intelligence. Surely no one could blame you for cutting your name short, said Ozma sympathetically. But didn't you cut it almost too short? Perhaps so, replied the wizard. When a young man, I ran away from home and joined a circus. I used to call myself a wizard and do tricks of ventriloquism. What does that mean? asked the princess. Throwing my voice into any object I pleased to make it appear that the object was speaking instead of me. Also, I began to make balloon extensions. On my balloon and on all the other articles, I used in the circus I painted the two initials, O-Z, to show that those things belonged to me. One day my balloon ran away with me and brought me across the deserts to this beautiful country. When the people saw me come from the sky, they naturally thought me some superior creature and bowed down before me. I told them I was a wizard and showed them some easy tricks that amazed them, and when they saw the initials painted on the balloon, they called me Oz. Now I begin to understand, said the princess, smiling. At that time, continued the wizard, busily eating his soup while talking, there were four separate countries in this land, each one of the four being ruled by a witch. But the people thought my power was greater than that of the witches, 
and perhaps the witches thought so too, for they never dared oppose me. I ordered the Emerald City to be built just where the four cor countries cornered together, and when it was completed, I announced myself the ruler of the Land of Oz, which included all the four countries of the Munchkins, the Gillikins, the Winkies, and the Quadlings. Over this land I ruled in peace for many years, until I grew old and longed to see my na native city once again. So when Dorothy was first blown to this place by a cyclone, I arranged to go away with her in a balloon. But the balloon escaped so soon and carried me back alone. After many adventures, I reached Omaha, only to find that all my old friends were dead or had moved away. So, having nothing else to do, I joined a circus again and made my balloon ascensions until the earthquake caught me. That is quite a history, said Ozma. But there is a little more history about the land of Oz that you do not seem to understand. Perhaps for the reason that no one ever told it to you. Many years before you came here, this land was united under one ruler, as it is now, and the ruler's name was always Oz, which means in our language, great and good. Or, if the ruler happened to be a woman, her name was always Ozma. But once upon a time, four witches leagued together to depose the king and rule the far four parts of the kingdom themselves. So when the ruler, my grandfather, was hunting one day, one wicked witch named Mombi stole him and carried him away, keeping him a close prisoner. Then the witches divided up the kingdom and ruled the four parts of it until you came here. That was why the people were so glad to see you, and why they thought from your initials that you were their rightful own, rightful ruler. But at that time, said the wizard thoughtfully, there were two good witches and two wicked witches ruling the land. Yes, replied Ozma, because the good witch had conquered Mombi in the north, and Glinda the good had conquered the evil witch in the south. But Mombi was still my grandfather's jailer, and afterward my father's jailer. When I was born, she transformed me into a boy, hoping that no one would ever recognize me and know that I was the rightful princess of the land of Oz. But I escaped her and am now the ruler of my people. I am very glad of that, said the wizard, and hope you will consider me one of your most faithful and devoted subjects. We owe a great deal to the wonderful wizard, continued the princess, for it was you who built this splendid emerald city. You built it, he answered. I only bossed the job, as we say in Omaha. But you ruled it wisely and well for many years, said she, and made the people proud of your magical art. So, as you are now too old to wander abroad and work in a circus, I offer you a home here as long as you live. You shall be the official wizard of my kingdom and be treated with every respect and consideration. I accept your kind offer with gratitude, gracious princess, the little man said in a soft voice, and they could all see the teardrops were standing in his keen old eyes. It meant a good de deal to him to secure a home like this. He's only a humbug wizard, though, said Dorothy, smiling at him. And that is the safest kind of wizard to have, replied Ozma promptly. Oz can do some good tricks, humbug or no humbug, announced Zeb who was now feeling more at ease. He shall amuse us with his tricks tomorrow, said the princess. I have sent messengers to summon all of Dorothy's old friends to meet her and give her welcome, and they ought to arrive soon now. Indeed, the dinner was no sooner finished than in rushed the scarecrow to hug Dorothy in his padded arms and tell her how glad he was to see her again. The wizard was also most heartily welcomed by the straw man, who was an important personage in the land of Oz. How are your brains? inquired the little humbug as he grasped the soft, stuffed hands of his old friend. Working finely, answered the scarecrow. I'm very certain, Oz, that you gave me the best brains in the world, for I can think with them day and night when all other brains are fast asleep. How long did you rule the Emerald City after I left here? was the next question. Quite a while until I was conquered by a girl named General Ginger. But Ozma soon conquered her with the help of Glinda the Good. And after that, I went to live with Nick Chopper, the Tin Woodman. Just then, a loud cackling was heard outside, 
and when a servant threw open the door with a low bow, the yellow hen strutted in. Dorothy sprang forward and caught the fluffy fowl in her arms, uttering at the same time a glad cry. Oh, Bellina, she said, how fat and sleek you've grown. Why shouldn't I? asked the hen in a sharp, clear voice. I live on the fat of the land, don't I, Ozma? You have everything you wish for, said the princess. Around Bellina's neck was a string of beautiful pearls, and on her legs were bracelets of emeralds. She nestled herself comfortably in Dorothy's lap, until the kitten gave a snarl of jealous anger and leapt up with a sharp claw fiercely bared to strike Bellina a blow. But the little girl gave the kitten, gave the angry kitten such a severe cuff that it jumped down again without daring to scratch. How horrid of you, Eureka, cried Dorothy. Is that the way to treat my friends? You have queer friends, seems to me, replied the kitten in a surly tone. Seems to me the same way, said Bellina scornfully, if that beastly cat is one of them. Look here, said Dorothy sternly. I won't have any quarreling in the land of Oz, I can tell you. Everybody lives in peace here, and loves everybody else. And unless you too, Bellina and Eureka, make up and be friends, I'll take my magic belt and wish you home again, immediately. So there. They were both much frightened at the threat, and promised meekly to be good. But it was never noticed that they became very warm friends, for all of that. And now the Tin Woodman arrived, his body most beautifully nickel-plated, so that it shone splendidly in the brilliant light of the room. The Tin Woodman loved Dorothy most tenderly, and welcomed with joy the return of the little old wizard. Sir, he said to the latter, I can never thank you enough for the excellent heart you once gave me. It has made me many friends, I assure you, and it be beats the kind as kindly and lovingly today as it ever did. I'm glad to hear that, said the wizard. I was afraid it would get moldy in that tin body of yours. Not at all, replied Ch Nick Chopper. It keeps finely being preserved in my airtight chest. Zeb was a little shy when first introduced to these queer people, but they were so friendly and sincere that he soon grew to admire them very much, even finding some good qualities in the yellow hen. But he became nervous again when the next visitor was announced. This, said Princess Ozma, is my friend Mr. H. M. Wogglebug, T.E., who assisted me one time when I was in great distress, and is now the Dean of the Royal College of Athletic Science. Ah, said the wizard, I'm pleased to meet so distinguished a personage. H. M., said the Wogglebug pompously, means highly magnified, and T.E. means thoroughly educated. I am, in reality, a very big bug and doubtless the most intelligent being in all this broad domain. How well you disguise it, said the wizard, but I don't doubt your word in the least. Nobody doubts it, sir, replied the Wogglebug, and drawing a book from its pocket, the strange insect turns its back on the company and sat down in a corner to read. Nobody minded this rudeness, which might have seemed more impolite in one less thoroughly educated, so they straightway forgot him, and joined in a merry conversation that kept him well amused until bedtime arrived. Chapter 16 Jim the Cab Horse Jim the Cab Horse found himself in possession of a large room with a green marble floor and carved marble wainscoting, which was so stately in its appearance that it would have awed anyone. Jim accepted it as a mere detail, and at his command the attendants gave his coat a good rubbing, combed his mane and tail, and washed his hoofs and fetlocks. They told him dinner would be served directly, and he replied that he could not, they could not serve it too quickly to suit his convenience. First they brought him a steaming bowl of soup, which the horse eyed in dismay. "'Take that stuff away,' he commanded. "'Do you take me for a salamander?' They obeyed at once and next served a fine, large turbot on a silver platter, with drawn gravy poured over it. "'Fish!' cried Jim with a sniff. "'Do you take me for a tomcat? Away with it!' The servants were a little discouraged, 
but soon they brought a tray containing two dozen nicely roasted quail on toast. Well, well, said the horse, now thoroughly provoked. Do you take me for a weasel? How stupid and ignorant you are in the land of Oz, and what dreadful things you feed upon. Is there nothing in this decent... Is there nothing that is decent to eat in this palace? The trembling servant sent for the royal steward, who came in haste and said, What would your highness like for dinner? Highness, repeated Jim, who was unused to such titles. You are at least six feet high, and that is higher than any other animal in this country, said the steward. Well, my highness would like some oats, declared the horse. Oats? We have no whole oats, replied the steward, with much deference. But there is any quantity, quantity of oatmeal, which we often cook for breakfast. Oatmeal is a breakfast dish, added the steward humbly. I'll make it a dinner dish, said Jim. Fetch it on, but don't cook it as you value your life. You see, the respect shown the old, worn-out old cab horse made him a little arrogant, and he forgot he was a guest never having been treated otherwise than as a servant since the day he was born, until his arrival in the land of Oz. But the royal attendants did not heed the animal's ill temper. They soon mixed a tub of oatmeal with a little water, and Jim ate it with much relish. Then the servants heaped a lot of rugs upon the floor, and the old horse slept on the softest bed he had ever known in his life. In the morning, as soon as it was daylight, he resolved to walk, take a walk and try to find some grass for breakfast. So he ambled calmly through the handsome arch of the doorway, turned the corner of the palace, wherein all sleem, seemed asleep, and came face to face with the sawhorse. Jim stopped abruptly, being startled and amazed. The hot sawhorse stopped at the same time and stared at the other with its queer protruding eyes which were mere knots in the log that formed its body. The legs of the sawhorse were four sticks driven into the holes bored in the log. Its tail was a small branch that had been left by accident, and its mouth a place chopped in one end of the body, which projected a little as it served as a head. The ends of the wooden legs were shod with plates of solid gold, and the saddle of Princess Ozma, which was of red leather, set with sparkling diamonds, was strapped to the clumsy body. Jim's eyes stuck out as much as those of the sawhorse, and he stared at the creature with his ears erect and his long head drawn back until it rested against his arched neck. In this comical position, the two horses circled slowly around each other for a while, each being unable to realize what the singular thing might be which it now beheld for the first time. Then Jim exclaimed, for goodness sake, what sort of being are you? I'm a sawhorse, replied the other. Oh, I believe I've heard of you, said the cab horse, but you are unlike anything that I expected to see. I do not doubt it, the sawhorse observed with a tone of pride. I am considered quite unusual. You are indeed, but a rickety wooden thing like you has no right to be alive. I couldn't help it, returned the other, rather crestfallen. Ozma sprinkled me with the magic powder, and I just had to live. I know I'm not much account, but I'm the only horse in the land of Oz, so they treat me with great respect. You? A horse? Oh, not a real one, of course. There are no real horses here, but I'm a splendid imitation of one. Jim gave an indignant neigh. Look at me, he cried. Behold, a real horse! Then the wooden animal gave a start and exclaimed the other in examined the other intently. Is it possible that you are a real horse? he murmured. Not only possible, but true, replied Jim, who was gratified by the impression he had created. It is proved by my fine points. For example, looking at the long hairs on my tail, with which I can whisk the way the flies. The flies never trouble me, said the sawhorse, and notice my good strong teeth, with which I nibble the grass. It is not necessary for me to eat, observed the sawhorse. Also, 
Examine my broad chest, which enables me to draw full, deep breaths, said Jim proudly. I have no need to breathe, returned the other. No, you miss many pleasures, remarked the cab horse pityingly. You do not know the relief of brushing away a fly that has bitten you, nor the delight of eating delicious food, nor the satisfaction of drawing a long breath of fresh, pure air. You may be an imitation of a horse, but you're a mighty poor one. Oh, I cannot ever hope to be like you, sighed the sawhorse, saw but I am glad to meet at last a real horse. You are certainly the most beautiful creature I have ever beheld. This praise won Jim completely. To be called beautiful was a novelty in his experience. Said he, Your chief fault, my friend, is in being made of wood, and that, I suppose, you cannot help. Real horses, like myself, are made of flesh and blood and bones. I can see the bones all right, replied the sawhorse, and they are admirable and distinct. Also, I can see the flesh. But the blood, I suppose is tucked away inside? Exactly, said Jim. What good is it? asked the sawhorse. Jim did not know, but he would not tell the sawhorse that. If anything cuts me, he replied, the blood runs out to show where I am cut. You poor thing! Cannot even bleed when you are hurt. But I am never hurt, said the sawhorse. Once in a while I get broken up some, but I am easily repaired and put in good order again and I never feel a break or a splinter in the least. Jim was almost tempted to envy the wooden horse for being unable to feel pain, but the creature was so absurdly unnatural that he decided he would not change places with it under any circumstances. How did you happen to be shod with gold? he asked. Princess Ozma did that, was the reply, and it saves my legs from wearing out. We've had a good many adventures together, Ozma and I, and she likes me. The cab horse was about to reply when suddenly he gave a start and a neigh of terror and stood trembling like a leaf. For around the corner had come two enormous savage beasts treading so lightly that they were upon him before he was aware of their presence. Jim was in the act of plunging down the path to escape when the sawhorse cried out, Stop, my brother, stop, real horse! These are friends, and will do you no harm. Jim hesitated, eyeing the beasts fearfully. One was an enormous lion with clear, intelligent eyes, and a tawny mane, bushy and well-kept, and a body like yellow plush. The other was a great tiger with purple stripes around his lithe body, powerful limbs, and eyes that showed through the half-closed lids like coals of fire. The huge forms of these monarchs of the forest and jungle were enough to strike terror into the stoutest heart, and it is no wonder Jim was afraid to face them. But the sawhorse introduced the stranger in a calm tone, saying, This noble horse is my friend the cowardly lion, who is the valiant king of the forest, but at the same time a faithful vassal of Princess Ozma. And this is the hungry tiger, the terror of the jungle, who longs to devour fat babies, but is prevented by his conscience from doing so. These royal beasts are both warm friends of little Dorothy, and have come to the Emerald City this morning to welcome her to our fairyland. Hearing these words, Jim resolved to conquer his alarm. He bowed his head with as much dignity as he could muster toward the savage-looking beasts, who in return nodded in a friendly way. Is not the real horse a beautiful animal? asked the sawhorse admiringly. This is doubtless a matter of taste, returned the lion. In the forest he would be thought ungainly, because his face is stretched out and his neck is uselessly long. His joints, I notice, are swollen and overgrown, and he lacks flesh, and is old in years. And dreadfully tough, added the tiger in a sad voice. My conscience would never permit me to eat so tough a morsel as a real horse. I'm glad of that, said Jim, for I also have a conscience, and it tells me not to crush your skull with a blow of my powerful hoof. If he thought to frighten the striped beast by such language, he was mistaken. The tiger seemed to smile and winked one eye slowly. You have a good conscience, friend horse, it said, 
and if you attend to its teachings, it will do much to protect you from harm. Some day I will let you try to crush in my skull, and afterward you will know more about tigers than you do now. Any friend of Dorothy, remarked the cowardly lion, must be our friend as well. So let us cease this talk of crushing skulls and converse upon more pleasant subjects. Have you breakfasted, Sir Horse? Not yet, replied Jim, but here is plenty of excellent clover, so if you will excuse me, I will eat now. He's a vegetarian, remarked the tiger, as the horse began to munch the clover. If I could eat grass, I would not need a conscience, for nothing could then tempt me to devour babies and lambs. Just then, Dorothy, who had risen early and heard the voices of the animals, ran out to greet her old friends. She hugged both the lion and the tiger with eager delight, but seemed to love the king of the beasts a little better than she did his hungry friend, having known him longer. By the time they had indulged in a good talk, and Dorothy had told them all about the awful earthquake and her recent adventures, the breakfast bell rang from the palace, and the little girl went inside to join her human comrades. As she entered the great hall, a voice called out, in rather a harsh tone, "'What? Are you here again?' "'Yes, I am,' she answered, looking all around to see where the voice came from. "'What brought you back?' was the next question, and Dorothy's eyes rested on an antlered head hanging on a wall just over the fireplace, and caught its lips in the act of moving. "'Good gracious!' she exclaimed. "'I thought you were stuffed.' "'So I am,' replied the head. "'But once on a time I was part of the gump which Ozma sprinkled with powder of life. I was then, for a time, the head of the finest flying machine that was ever known to exist, and we did many wonderful things. Afterward, the gump was taken apart, and I was put back on this wall. But I can still talk when I feel in the mood, which is not often. It is very strange, said the girl. What were you when you were first alive? That I have forgotten, replied the gump's head, and I do not think it is of much importance. But here comes Ozma so I'd better hush up, for the princess doesn't like me to chatter, since she changed her name from Tip to Ozma. Just then, the girlish ruler of Oz opened the door and greeted Dorothy with a morning kiss. The little princess seemed fresh and rosy, and in good spirits. Breakfast is served, dear, she said, and I am hungry, so don't let us keep it waiting a single minute. And that is the end of chapter 16. Tomorrow we'll read 17 and 18 and finish up with 19 and 20 on Thursday. So I hope you're enjoying the book. I am enjoying sharing it with you and look forward to sharing the next two chapters with you tomorrow. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful day.